Clark LaCour from HokumHeadlines.com, Hokum Horn Show. Uh, coming back at y'all today with uh, getting back to the weekly show here. Um, I was uh, traveling last week, so um, but be back this week and the rest of the season last week was the only travel week that I have like during the week for the season. So um, we got plenty to talk about this week, just in terms of where the Longhorns are at, you know, what the program or I guess like what the team will look like for the rest of the fall, just because Texas is number one for the first time since 2008 in the AP poll. Um, I think that this offense has been um, has been really just seamless just proficient no matter who has been in quarterback for the past few games. I mean, obviously you had the Quinn Ewards injury last weekend, an, ob- an abdominal strain, something for a quarterback that could be potentially pretty disastrous in terms of the injury timeline, but it sounds like he's going to be back here, I'd say at a maximum by Red River, potentially by the Mississippi State game next weekend. Um, and also, Texas's defense has just been playing lights out. Um, Texas cruised to three and zero record this season, um, and I would assume four and zero after after this weekend against ULM. Um, but Tarek, I'll pass it over to you. What are what are some of your thoughts coming out of the U- UTSA game, and you know what the team looks like in general after three weeks? Well, I think you got to see what the team will look like in 2025 and beyond with Arch Manning, which is very exciting to see. It was also good to see that. <clears throat> The offense didn't miss a beat when Arch came in. And even though Arch has some things he's got to work on, that's what you expect for a redshirt freshman, no matter how talented they are. But I think that Texas could be very successful if he has to play for an extended amount of time. But looks like Quinn will be okay. Uh, Quinn himself was looking great, looking every bit of a Heisman finalist when he got hurt. And we're thankful that It wasn't too bad of an injury, but good to have him rest this week and hopefully have him ready for SEC play. I I think the the biggest thing is that Texas has an embarrassment of riches on offense. Uh, Ryan Wingo is just unreal what he's been able to do. Isaiah Bond looks like he's really coming coming on now. Gunnar Helm doing some really great things. And... I, uh, you know, so I, I don't think <clears throat> for to quote uh, Anna from Frozen for the first time in forever, uh, Texas has nothing to complain about. So that everything's looking great. Yeah, well, one thing I would probably complain about right now is running back injuries. That's been <laughs> OK, Andrew, do we <laughs> sorry. I mean, everyone's got something something to complain (laughs) about, but it's just, it's hard to find. Yeah. Okay. Since the season has started, not much to complain about. How's that? That's true. Yeah. I mean, I think to be fair, I think a lot of the injuries, if you will, were just precautions last weekend for like, you know, Trey Trey Weiser not playing the second half, Jane Blue getting held out. Uh, You know, I I think it's good for Jane Blue. I I doubt he's going to play all that much this weekend. Um, if he's, you know, if he's actually dealing with any sort of severe ankle sprain, I think it's best to make sure he's all healed up for OU. Yeah. With the 12 team playoff, if you could rest players, just go ahead and rest them. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Jared Gibson's been doing pretty well with, with, you know, handling I, at this point, what really has been the lead role for like the last game and a half, just because playing it safe with blue. And especially last weekend, playing and safe with Weisner after he had a tweak, I believe it was what Sarkeesian said, the reason he was held out. That said, um, you know, I, I like you mentioning the all the young guys getting a lot of reps early on. Specifically last weekend, I thought a lot of the young guys on defense looked impressive. You had a lot of the obvious guys that you would expect on offense that I say obvious. And that really shows how, I mean, just the fact that I think so apparently that guys like Ryan Wingo and Arch Manning, could just come in and and do really whatever they want on the field and, you know, put up huge production and, and really look the part right away. Um, just shows, like you said, the embarrassment of riches here, all these talented freshmen that Texas has. Um, Texas between we, between weeks one and three has gotten to play over 70 players. Um, I think that's really tremendous. You're seeing a lot of guys get these early valuable live game reps um, that you really haven't in in years past that, you know, you really feel this good about, you know, just 
I'd say even guys as young as freshman, redshirt freshman, second year players that have really been looking good. Um, I want to know maybe a couple of guys for you that maybe if it's particular last weekend or just to start the season in general have have really stood out. You know, freshmen that you know really have been pretty impactful oh, in the reps they've gotten. Ryan Wingo. <clears throat> yeah, I yeah, those uh, are like probably the three big three ones. years ago they would have been starters when Scott got here. Um, yeah. So that tells you how much things have changed. Uh, I've been very impressed with Anthony Hill, but that's not a surprise. <clears throat> I think uh, Jody Barron has uh, done very well too. Yeah, he's all he's all he's kind of everywhere. Um, Leona LaFowle, when he's gotten his chance, I've been impressed with him. Uh, Ty Anthony Smith, I got, that guy can really fly the ball. But the guy who really impressed me when he got his chance is uh, Colton Vosick. <laughs> guy looks like he's going to be a monster when he gets his chance. Like, ooh. I was like, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember. He used to do that in high school all the time. So he's been good. <clears throat> but everybody is, who's played has been impressive. <clears throat> I think the most undersung person, though, is uh, Michael Taff. He's just, uh, he's just been everywhere and been very good for the secondary. Yeah, I mean – the secondary in general has been really good to start the season. Um, one of the best pass defenses in the nation. I believe they're in the top 10 in the nation in passing defense after the first three weeks. Um, you know, Malik Muhammad and Jade Bear, and I posted a stat today. They're the only starting corner duo in, in uh, the P4 this season that's combined for over five pass breakups, no touchdowns allowed, no defensive pass interference, and under uh, under a quarter under a quarter of a yard per covered snap. So they've been locked down and Makuba, Taff, Williams in the secondary, you know, Williams getting his first career interception this year, a couple of weeks ago. And um, Makuba, I think looked really good the past couple of weeks. Um, Tony Anthony Smith was one name I did want to point out just because I thought he really looked like, yeah, he was really sniffing out the ball and just exploding to the ball carrier last weekend against UTSA. Colton Boschick looked, yeah, really good uh, late in that game. Um, turning the attention now to the offensive side of the ball, and then we'll kind of bridge over into talking about ULM. Um, you know, one thing that I thought was interesting for Arch last weekend was kind of not only how quickly he was getting the ball out, but it felt like how how little of respect, I guess, UTSA was giving to his ability to throw the ball downfield. Um, I don't know if that was something you noticed, or maybe it's just something that they were just like, okay, we're going to try to take away the run and not, you know, if they hit us over the top, then so be it. But, you know, Arch Manning hit three passes of over 15 yards, air yards, at least, um, not to mention that long, what was it? 75 yard touchdown pass to Ryan Wingo. That was really, really nice on that deep ball connection. Um, what, what are you thinking about like Arch's, uh, his deep ball so far and just in general, how he's looking back in the pocket? Uh, I like that he is making such quick decisions. Uh, it, it seems yours is a bit more, it seems more like he contemplates a little bit more, whereas Arch is like, I see that go, see that go, see it go. Um, although, so I, I, I've been in, uh, very pleased with that. Uh, his ability to just take off and run, I mean, how could you not be blown away by that? It just is incredible. Uh, so I, I, there's a lot to like there. Um, you do see things where you're like, yeah, there's there's still things he's got he's got to tighten up, uh, you know, seeing that blind side uh, <clears throat> rush coming from the corner. That was a big one, but... Overall, I mean, I don't think there's much to complain about there either. So, well done, Arch. But I can't say I'm exactly surprised. He's he comes from uh, royal royal blood. True. I mean, I do think on I th- yeah, you're talking about that one play that he was sacked off. Of, what was it a corner blitz or something like that? A DB blitz against uh, UTSA. Yeah. I I do think that he could use a little bit of help. He's been sacked. Uh, one time, well, okay. The Colorado state one, that was just, that, I don't really count that as a sack. I really thought that was a heads up play when he dove on that fumble. So technically he's been sacked one time per start, but you're right. I, I do think that he could probably use a little bit of help. Maybe someone, you know, we have a lot of experienced offensive linemen, 
you, you notice that guy creeping up to the line of scrimmage, someone, you know, give him some help, call that out um, until he starts getting a little bit more comfortable in the offense here in a few games. Um, that said, I mean, it's hard to fault his efforts last weekend in particular, over 50 rushing yards, over 200 passing yards, nine of 12 passing, 75% completion percentage coming in in that situation is really remarkable. And he just looked really impressive. Um, specifically to the ULM game now, I I do. Th- and actually, one thing I did want to add to the Quinn thing, I, I do think that's the one thing that Quinn just has. And, and, you know, he's a third year starting quarterback. He's got just ridiculous arm talent, especially, you know, this like kind of middle of the field or just like intermediate level throws. His ability to navigate the pocket and get the ball where it needs to go there and just like the flick of a wrist is insane. Um, I mean, that's just something that even someone as talented as Arch, I just don't know that they bring that to the table necessarily. It's just natural for Quinn. Um, That said, for Arch, you know, he brings that dynamic, that dual threat ability that obviously you don't get with Quinn. So, um, I mean, there's specific things that make each of these quarterbacks really special and talented um, that that Texas can utilize. Um, Now, specifically for the ULM game, you know, Louisiana Monroe comes in 2 0. Uh, They had a pretty impressive 36 to, or yeah, 30, excuse me, 32 to 6 win over UAB a couple of weeks ago. Um, That's a UAB team that, kind of almost all upset Arkansas last weekend uh, through three quarters of that game. UAB really looked like the better team until Arkansas put them away in the fourth quarter. Um, ULM's not a program that traditionally has had a ton of success, to say the very least. Um, Winning seasons have been very sparing for them for the last few decades, but they're off to a good start this year. I think head coach Brian Vinson has them headed in the right direction. That said, they're four at what forty five point underdogs against Texas this weekend. This is going to be a daunting task for them. Um, you know, uh, Texas really blew them out when they faced them in the season opener two years ago. It was like fifty two to seven. I do believe that was Quinn's first career start at Texas. Yep, he th- he threw his first interception and his first several touchdowns against you all. Yeah. Yep, and. Uh, you know, I, I this weekend I, I expect another situation where Texas tries to get ahead early. Um, I, I do, I do have a question for you off the top here. Do you think that if for one, I guess, assuming Texas is up by a few touchdowns after the first half at at the very least, do you think we see Trey Owens exclusively in the second half at quarterback? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, I guess it depends on how well the first half goes. Um, if it's like 35, nothing, I could see it. Uh, but you know, we'll have to wait and see, but I, yeah, I could, I could definitely see something like that happening for sure. Yeah. I think it really depends on how Texas fares against the run for Louisiana Monroe early. You know, this is a really like run heavy kind of go-go style offense almost for ULM. They, they do a lot of different like run play packages and stunts and whatnot that you wouldn't see from a lot of other offenses. They've got th- like three different backs. They like to use some bigger backs too. Um, but this, I, I do say, like, watching them against UAB, I do think that this is a team that's a lot faster than they used to be. Um, that I can say for sure. And just in general, I mean, they've already won as many games as they did all of last season through through two weeks. Um, also a name that a lot of Texas fans are probably familiar with from ULM, General Booty, their starting quarterback. Um, transfer from Oklahoma, also former JUCO guy, um, through two games, ha- isn't putting any crazy numbers up 193 or excuse me 191 passing yards one touchdown again this is a very run heavy offense they run it on about 75 percent of plays so you're probably going to be see something similar here but if texas can get up early in this game and they really you know set the tone in the trenches and i think command you know command the line the way that they should be able to you know texas's run defense i think has been pretty good um and it's been improving game by game um, they did really well against Michigan, held UTSA was to just over three yards of carry. If you eliminate that one, um, I think what was it like a 50 yard run play that UTSA had uh, last weekend, then Texas, I believe, held them. It was under a yard and a half per carry. So I uh, I think for this weekend or maybe it was like a yard and three quarters, something in that ballpark. All I want is another shutout. <clears throat> That's fair. Yeah, Texas was close. Um but, I, you know, I think they can do that this weekend. Again, if they really get up early and get up big, then I this ULM offense can get buried pretty fast. 
Um, Texas also, I always do this calculation on either side of the football, um, massive size discrepancy in the trenches, even more so than they had against UTSA. It's about 35 pound difference on offense on defense. It's about 28 pounds. It's, you know, this should be another week where Texas looks the part on both sides of the ball. And, you know, the offensive line has been really, really, really solid through the first few weeks. Um, I think that will continue again this weekend. Um, you know, for other position groups here, the secondary, uh, you know, I, I do want to see how they are able to contest space and, you know, get to the run, um, maybe help out in the box a little bit more. But uh, also this could be a really big week for the linebackers, I think. You know, seeing some of these guys, Anthony Hill, who's just really looked amazing through the first three weeks, seems like he's just everywhere on the field. David Benda, I think, has gotten off to a solid start. And you can get to see guys like Leonga LaFowle. That's one name that I've wanted to talk about a lot because I think LaFowle has been really solid early this season, too. Um, he's uh, second among Texas linebackers in defensive stops already. Um, and he's really only getting like second half reps for the defense. So, um, you know, he's really doing a good job of getting around the football. Um, he's really natural in pass defense. I know we always talk about that, that he's had that ability, but you've really seen that come to fruition consistently each game he's played this season. He's gotten on the field at least in all three games at some point, because I really think he is kind of the backup middle linebacker at this point, I like that established role. Um, I mean, is there anything else that you would be watching out for for Texas on defense <clears throat> to he's see this the, weekend? Well, I would say is the more natural middle linebacker, but Anthony Hill is just such a freak. Oh, yeah. I'm not trying to make the case that Anthony Hill is is by any means worse than LaFowle. I guess you could maybe make a case dropping into pass coverage. <laughs> but no, I just think no. that I just think LaFowle is more of a <coughs> if you were <coughs> excuse me, if you were trying to make a prototype of a middle linebacker, LaFowle kind of fits that more. Hill is I mean, Hill is is as very good as an inside guy, but you could make the case that he's even better as a edge rusher. Or not, or more of an off-ball backer than just a pure middle linebacker, boundary uh, linebacker almost. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he's a, you know, Anthony Hill is kind of a positionless player, but I got to see him up close. Now, every, and this is when the players were just walking by uh, on Saturday. Uh, all football players are big dudes, but I remember seeing Anthony Hill thinking like, that is a big dude. And then thank you, like, oh, yeah, he actually hits people, too. I was like, ooh, that's going to hurt. But, yeah, he, he's he's a, he's he's quite a specimen. <clears throat> yeah, so, okay. Um, I think, are, are we in agreement this week that, like, it's really the linebackers that if you're looking for any group to watch on defense, that it it, it should be them against this run-heavy ULM offense? Yeah, yeah. Basically, the linebackers need to make it three and out. And then we should use this game to get the running game really go going to get the game to go by faster. You know, don't get the ball on the ground. Don't stop the clock. That, yeah. That's 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 what I think Texas should kind of do. And also limit the opportunity because let's face it, you're already on your second string quarterback and you don't want to get him hurt too. And they don't think that that, you know, just can't happen. So try to protect Arch as much as you can. and. Make make sure you're as healthy as you can be going into Mississippi State. True. You know, uh, looking, I think there's an interesting matchup on both sides of the ball here between the running backs and the linebackers, because I actually think the strength of the ULM defense is their linebackers. Um, I was looking at it. Something kind of caught my attention statistically about this ULM defense. Their run defense is actually pretty good. Um, it might be not, not might be, it is the best run defense that Texas is going to face of any G five opponent this year. And I would make a case that they're better than like Mississippi state's run defense. I know that doesn't say a lot, but, um, considering Mississippi state just got handled by Toledo by what, 24 points on their, uh, actually, I think they were on the road either way. It doesn't matter, um, whether they were at home or on the road. Um, ULM allowed, uh, fewer yards per carry to UAB than Arkansas did. I know that this like transitive property isn't super valid everywhere, but like ULM holding UAB to 2.6 yards a carry and UAB going for about three and a half yards per carry against Arkansas. Mind you, the same Arkansas defense that really shut down the Doak Walker award winner from last year, Ollie Gordon, when they lost to Oklahoma State on the road a couple of weeks ago. 
This ULM run defense, like looking at it, their linebackers are really fast. The defensive line is small, but their linebackers really know how to hit their gaps and, and get to the ball carrier and play downhill really well. They got two of the highest graded uh, run defenders. I believe it's Billy Pullen and, and Carl Glass in the entire Sun Belt this season. I believe two of the top five, or two of the top ten. And so they played Jackson State, I believe was their first opponent. I would have to look back at that, but um, they played two games. So I, I don't know how much stock you want to put into that. Yeah. Jackson state and UAB, but I still think that this could be actually a decent test. If you're looking at it, I, I think Texas is, pa- I think Texas is passing offense against their past defenses is it's just going to wipe the floor with them. But knowing you got Jaden Blue potentially held out for this game and Trey Wisner got tweaked last week and, you know, how short Texas is at running back, they might have to get creative. You know, we saw Colin Page getting out on the field a little bit last week. And he's second in yards per carry among all Texas backs. So um, that's going to be an interesting matchup for me. I, I I wanted to ask you this. Do you think Jarrett Gibson gets over 100 yards this weekend? If he gets 20 plus carries, I think so. Yeah, I might agree on that front because I think I don't. Are we in agreement that Trey Wisner is probably both Trey Wisner and Jaden Blue probably are not getting double digit carries this weekend? I wouldn't be surprised if both are held out. Just you need you need to get everybody ready for SEC play. So, yeah, I think this could be like a heavy like Velton Gardner and even like Ryan Niblett. Niblett's been getting a lot of a lot of work this year. Um, That dude's got some jets. I mean, he's. He's still obviously learning the position, but he's got a lot going for him. Also, I think this could be a game where Sark's still passing the ball when Texas is up by like 40, 50 points, just because, again. He's like, yeah. he's like, yeah, the fans are in the stands. You might as well give him a show. Right. Um, is there anything else you're watching out for this weekend? I mean. Um, I just want to see another clean game. No penalties. Uh, keep, obviously, injuries to a minimum. And right. let's uh, get ready for the SEC. It, do, it, am I the only one that doesn't feel like SEC play starts next weekend just because it's Mississippi State? Uh, I'm one of those people that just doesn't take any game for granted. Uh, That's fair. Teams that teams just aren't the same when they play Texas. Especially it, Jeff Levy. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's fair. Also, and you know they're they're going to run a style of offense that's going to be a really good preparation for OU because even though OU doesn't run that just straight veer shoot anymore, that wide open spread up tempo that will prepare Texas for OU. So, and I can almost guarantee you that OU is going to run Jackson Arnold double digit times against Texas because they're just not getting much would, moving on if, offense if, otherwise. I don't if if they don't if they want. Jackson Arnold to play the next week. I would highly recommend not doing that. <laughs> oh no, I'm in against. Te- well, yeah, dude, they have. Yeah, oh you, oof, they got a rough uh, season. I mean, ahead. If you, they got problems. <laughs> if you th- if you think that Anthony Hill has forgotten last year, I'm <laughs> you're you're profoundly mistaken. <laughs> so. I think Jody Barron too. Sorry, you know what? Let me go back to something really quick. Did you see the ULM head coach today? Oh, please don't get me started on that clown. God knows, man. Bill, bulletin board material against ULM? Come on. I'm like, <laughs> like you really didn't learn anything from Iowa State, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, and specifically mentioning Arch Manning and how so, a lot of his guys played against him in high school and beat him. Oh, got a puppy in the background. Okay. Uh, <laughs> She's cute. Yeah. The audience will like her. Um. Okay, so anyway, moving on from that, the only other thing I'll say about the game, um, first game that Texas has ever had where it's called by, like, Lowell Galindo, Fozzie Whitaker, um, ESPN Plus and SEC Network Plus. It's on streaming only this weekend, but I got to say it at least not on Longhorn Network. For me, I consider that a victory, I think, for most people, too. Wait, wait, wait. The game is on what now? ESPN Plus and SEC Network Plus. It's streaming only this weekend. Oh, I think I, I think doesn't YouTube TV have ESPN Plus? It might. If you have Disney Plus, then okay, then I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, it, I, uh, it's like if you have Watch ESPN, then you're good. Um, but yeah, I. Uh, so, 
Well, I guess let's get on to score predictions. And then I was going to do a couple uh, a couple SEC I, I, questions same, for same, you. Same with last week, 70 nothing. Going with the same score? Okay. It's basically the same team, dude. <laughs> yeah. I think that we're I think that we're gonna have some like I think once Trey Owens gets in the game, I think that there's gonna be some slower drives because we're gonna be trying to pass the ball and I think ULM's gonna be keeping their starters in the entire game. I'm gonna go fifty one to six. It sounds right. Um I'll be interested to see the other score predictions. So as of week after week three. You have one of the closest scores. If we're just talking about the people on the YouTube show, it's Shane one. Yeah, never mind. Shane one. You have you know two. What? Look, I, I gave that score last week. That's lazy. I'll say this. Let's go. 56, nothing. Okay. Cause we got the score predictions up on the site. So even if we don't, even though we weren't on last week, we still got the documentation and everything, but yeah, uh, just with the YouTube show you, Oh, dang. Okay. <laughs> Ironic timing there, Mark. I, uh, we, we were just talking about score predictions and everything like that. So uh, I'll, I all, I know Tarek's got to get running here soon. So I'll, I'll talk a few things with you. Um, but I not to, you know what, Mark, I'll get your score prediction here a little bit later. Um, there are some rapid fire things that I wanted to, uh, wanted to ask y'all really quick. Cause I do want to do like more of the sec preview next week. And then, um, Tark, I'll, I'll let you get up and running. Um, so the sec right now, I mean, Texas, I, I think is the top dog right now. Number one in the AP poll. Uh, they were number one for me and my, I do my weekly conference power rankings on the site for the sec. And I have them above, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Ole Miss. I think that's kind of an established top five right now. Um, who who are y'all picking right now out like outside of Texas as the favorite to end up in the SEC championship game? I haven't changed Texas, Alabama. <clears throat> okay. What about you? I, 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 to, I, I, I've been telling people, I was like, here's the problem. It's like Georgia doesn't have the – they still have a very good defense, but they're not the defensive – Two, two, three years ago or two years ago, and now they don't have the offense because their offensive line isn't as good as it used to be. And Carson Beck is not Quinn Ewers. He might he 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 has the perfect like picture of what a quarterback's supposed to be, but he doesn't ever do anything that makes you just think like, wow. Reminds me a lot of JJ McCarthy, but Jalen Milrow. I mean, this guy, you know, he he's got some real talent, uh, and I think. Uh, I think I'll I think he will beat Georgia again and I don't and they might drop a game, but I, I expect it to be Texas, Alabama, which would be good for Sark because Sark needs to beat DeBoer. So it just it's just cosmic fate that, that happens. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? Well, I, I kind of agree. I, I happened to watch the Alabama's last game and, and I thought that Mill Rose starting to come into his own. Uh I I think the shadow of ha- you know Nick, Nick Saban casts a big shadow. I think that's a, a you know a big shadow of, over the program in particular, and especially at the quarterback position. And for any major uh, sports team, when it comes to football, quarterback position is highly scrutinized. I just think that James Milrose ha- kind of relaxed, and he's so focused on getting back uh, to where Alabama needs to be. I, I, I totally agree. It's going to be Alabama. Uh, I wouldn't sleep on Georgia. Uh, I think Missouri's a, a team that, you know, people may not be talking about, and also Tennessee. Interested to see what Tennessee does when they go up to Norman. I think that's a big game for them as a program. Although I don't think Oklahoma's, you know, quite peaking right just right now. I think their defense is better than their offense right now. But I think that Tennessee is a team that, you know, maybe people aren't looking at it. You want to say, hey, you, might, you want to keep your lazy eye on this team because they got some guys in the skill position. Uh, they're pretty good in the trenches. And, you know, a lot of times it's always those teams that come out of nowhere to kind of surprise you. But I, I like Alabama, Texas in the in the SEC championship right now because I think that when Georgia comes to Texas, Texas will take care of them. Yeah, I don't think, and it sounds like y'all are kind of in agreement here with me, that I just don't think Georgia has the weapons on the outside right now. Like, their running game's also not what I thought it would be. They, the trench, just in general, on both sides of the ball in the trenches, they're not what you expect from Georgia. I think they'll get there defensively, and the offense will improve. 
But unless they find someone else to go to, unless they find a new receiver weapon to go to on the outside, I don't I don't know what they're going to do to really kind of match those elite tier teams. Otherwise, in the SEC, they got some tough games this year, too. Well, I, the, I the team to not sleep tough- on. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. The Kentucky game this weekend was a little telltale sign of some things that they need to clean up. Uh, Kirby Smart said after what the after the game that hey, you know, there's a lot of things that they got a bye week here, and then they come out and they go to Alabama. So there's some things that they got to clean up. I'm sure they'll shuffle some lineups and make some things happen. Uh, you know, looking for some more playmakers, but I wouldn't count them out just because of their pedigree. Uh, you know, this championship pedigree there, Kirby Smart and that staff have been together for a while. They have a sta- stability at the quarterback position, which is what you need to be a contender. So, you know, giving them a week off is kind of like, you know, let, letting them reload and reset, going back to spring ball kind of, uh, you know, aspect when it comes to practice and being able to uh, construct game plans for the next week. The team to not sleep on in the SEC is Ole Miss. <clears throat> yeah, I think. Um, because Lane Kiffin is trying to get them to the playoff, and then he's taking his behind to Gainesville. That's what's going to happen, I'm calling it You now. think? Absolutely. Lane here's Kiffin the thing. Here, here's, here's why it's a smart thing for him to do it. Um, <clears throat> look from Gainesville to uh, Tallahassee. If you try to build a team through the portal every year, eventually that's going to blow up on you. Oh, that's yeah. Or State did. Now, if you recruit the way Lane Kiffin can recruit, and he's one of the best recruiters in college football, and you go to the state of Florida, you will turn that around in two years with the with the portal. You'll be you'll be gravy. The fact is, you're just not going to recruit that way in in Mississippi, in Oxford. So he's. He's putting in his chips this year. He could make a really good playoff run, but I think he ends up in Gainesville. Yeah, that's fair. I think I think that there's five and one right now. I think Mizzou I think is kind of that. Very upset that he didn't get the Alabama job. I think there's a part oh, of him sure. that's really upset. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a similar dynamic for Josh Heupel this weekend, man. I think that. I think he's going to have a little, I mean, not a little. I think he's going to have a big chip on his shoulder in that regard. I mean, if he didn't need to already, game day is going to be there. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a good litmus test to see if OU can hold up in the trenches on both sides of the ball. I mean, Mark, you mentioned it. Tennessee's pretty damn good on the defensive line, like better than I thought they were going to be. And right. that for me is kind of like, oh, crap. Like Tennessee can be really good this year, like championship contender good. Yeah. Um, I think some teams have kind of fallen off for me a little bit. I think LSU, OU I, I have kind of fallen behind. This bridges me into my next question for y'all. Of Texas's two biggest rivals, which one scares you more at this point? Is it AM or is it OU? I, I mean, I'll say AM because not only the road environment, but I think Marcel Reed is a little bit of a game changer for them at quarterback, adding that new dynamic to that offense. But I'll pass it over to y'all. No. <laughs> you neither neither scare me. They just Still Look, neither. Okay. There's the there's the rivalry dynamic of Red River, which never makes any sense. I would I don't bet on games anyway, but I would never bet on Red River if I did bet. Uh AM, <clears throat> they're still trying to figure it out. They played a terrible Florida team. I don't know. I don't really know what that's telling you. It tells you they're not at the pit of the SEC, which they we knew that anyway. <clears throat> but are they, how are they going to really stand up? I don't know. It's very telling to me that, um, let's see, I, I, I still don't understand how, let's see, wait, Notre Dame scored, what, 23 points on AM. Yeah. How much did Notre Dame scare against NIU? 14. Okay, so <laughs> NIU gave up more less points than – Texas a and to that not very good Notre Dame offense. I, again, I, I'm just, I'm not impressed, but I didn't expect to be impressed this early. I'm giving Elko two, two years of, as mulligans as, as you kind of should with in the modern era. Uh, Venables, I think is in a really odd situation because if he gets, you know, blown out or, or loses badly to uh, uh, Tennessee and then loses to Texas, if they go like seven and five, I know that that was kind of what was expected, but the thing is, it's like, okay, wait a second. This was year three. This was the year you're supposed to prove, like, this is really my team. This is where we're going. And they just seem like everywhere they're getting worse. So 
I don't that that's discouraging but maybe that's why they gave him that extension for absolutely no reason there's there's a there's a chance that oh you could lose i'm not saying that they will i don't think that's going to happen but there's a chance that oh you could lose all but one of the rest of the games on their schedule because i think south carolina is actually pretty good they go to auburn and then the rest of their games are against south Carolina teams. Is beat lsu last last year if they if that yeah. If number five doesn't hit that quarterback for dude, absolute, that's not a penalty. That game, was I don't need over. to get into that. That wasn't a penalty. He was, I mean, yeah. that wasn't a penalty. I don't think it was either, but still, but it was like I'm the saying, butt South targeting. South Carolina should have won that game. There, South Carolina is a good team. Um, yeah, they are. And so I, I think Auburn. I don't know if LSU is a good team. I really neither do I. Don't the LSU and Oklahoma in a way are kind of mirror images of like I think that yeah they're. Kelly and Venables in year three, right? Yeah, they got hired the yeah. same time. <clears throat> and I'm like, I just don't know where that either program is going. And that's not where you want to be in year three. Year three oh, is you more and- like, okay, I have a clear vision of your trajectory. Like, Sark taking Texas in the right direction. Versus Herman, you're like, I don't know what's going on. And that doesn't bode well. It's just Well, I think for OU... I mean, I think the defense is coming together, but just the offense continually looks worse and worse and more disjointed every year since Lincoln Riley's been gone. And, you know, I know Jeff Lebby left, but like he I think half of OU fans were excited when he left for whatever reason. That said, I don't because they were just, you know, it's not unlike when like, you know, like everyone started cheering really, really hard when Arch Manning came into the game last week. It's because there's everybody loves the new toy. I so, do. Yeah. Because it's like, I, as you can tell from, you know, Cal Herd and all these other people talk, they're like, well, I don't know, man. Arch Manning's pretty good. I was like, literally less than a week, what, a week ago, Quinn Ewers went into the big house with five, with five top 40 picks on defense and tore them up. It's like, did, 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 we just, we all forgot that because Arch Manning beat up a junior college team. I'm like, come on. <laughs> but it's it's the same thing. You got the five star on the bench. We have to have him, even though Dylan Gabriel just got you ten wins. It's just yeah. I was gonna say that. I bet hard. Venables wants Gabriel back. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Well, just like uh, well, I, to which I'm sure like this is what you get for you have a you know steady wife and you go and chase the young, the pretty young thing. That's that's what you get. Yeah. Do anyway. As a happily married man. Don't do that. <laughs> Mark, Mark, what are you kind of in the same boat as Tarek, or do you feel like OU or AM is more like a scarier game right now for Texas? Uh, I don't think that either, either team doesn't scare me. I would say OU's defense is ahead of their offense. I think by the time they get to Texas, that'll be the best defense that they've played, uh, you know, after the Mississippi State game. Uh, I think the wild card is, you know, they haven't even decided who's going to start now that, uh, you know, Marshall Reed comes out and has a big game. I think he gives them a different dynamic uh, because, they, you know, they, they've been depleted with injury-wise with the running back uh, position. I, I was really impressed with Terry Bussey and his play a little bit. I think he gets the ball a little more. Uh, you you got to get this guy on the field and figure out what role he plays. Uh, you know, he, we're talking about a guy that was an All-State, All-American, five-star recruit. Uh, I like the way he played a little bit. Uh, mentioned the LSU, I think they need to figure out what their identity is. Uh, I was impressed with Caden Durham's performance. That was a, a big, big uh, fourth quarter for them, you know, for somebody coming in, uh, you know, a, a big time freshman player like that in a hostile environment on the road. They need that. So I, I think it's, you know, Brian Kelly's the guy that's it's been one of those guys that likes to put the ball in there a lot. Sometimes you may have to switch philosophies to be successful. Go with your strengths instead of what everybody expects you to do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I think that when you talk about young quarterbacks, and that uh, includes Arch Manning, and that includes Jackson Arnold, experience is the best thing that they need. You know, the reason that uh, Quinn Ewers is starting, if, if if Arch Manning was better and ready to go, he would be starting, obviously. Quinn Ewers is better than him right now because he has the experience. Quinn's not because he's not been able to stay healthy. You have Arch Manning in, in, uh, you know, in the bullpen because of the injury history that Ewers has had. Right now, the Texas is sitting in a great position. And then, listen, I love what Trey Owens is doing, what he brings to the table. Trey Owens was very under-recruited coming out of high school. These guys, you you have to do your due diligence when it comes to recruiting. 
that's just bigger than the four and five stars. You know, everybody gets hung up on that. Uh, you know, th those are just evaluations. Look at the, the pattern of how guys develop. And that's the thing that Texas is doing. They got back to developing their players and developing players within their system. That's the reason you have first round picks is because you're developing and you're getting those guys on the field and they're making plays and paying dues, you know, at the particular time. These next few games, Texas just has to, you know, wave, wave the water and keep everything consistent. I think this week you come out, you get Arch, uh, so, some feel good plays out the out of the gate. You know, don't come out and just sling the ball all over the place. Establish a running game, get him comfortable, work out the kinks, keep him healthy, and keep everybody else healthy. Because when you come into that first game in Mississippi State, we need to be hitting on all cylinders, getting ready for OU, getting ready for Georgia. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, Tarek, I don't know if you got to get up and run in here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Tarek. Um, I will uh, catch you next week for the SEC preview. Um, but, yeah, we already got your score prediction. Uh, so, first of two hook'ems. There we go. Hook'em. Hook'em. Um, so, Mark, uh, you know, Tark and I, uh, we, we kind of done, like, a, a quick preview of ULM and um, kind of at a high level, the things that I was talking about. I thought it was an interesting matchup to see – on both teams, the running backs versus the linebackers, because I think for Texas this weekend, there's not much about ULM's pass game that really scares me at all. Um, but they're running backs. They run, you know, three, four different guys. They run the ball about 75 percent of the time. I think this is a big opportunity for, you know, guys like David Benda, Anthony Hill, even like Leon Lafau, Ty Anthony Smith, Mo Blackwell to, you know, really show that they can fly around the ball and have a big day on Saturday. Opposite of that, I actually, one of the things that I think is pretty underrated about ULM is their run defense. They are pretty damn good. They, uh, their linebackers, uh, I was talking to Tark about this. I, uh, they're two of their best run stopping linebackers are two of the 10 highest graded run defenders in the Sun Belt. Granted, they played two games, but you know, I, uh, one thing to note, they did better against the run against UAB than Arkansas did against UAB. Um, and this is an Arkansas defense that had really stymied last year's Doak Walker Award winner. Take that at face value. But, you know, I, I think it could be interesting to see this weekend. Um, I don't know any of your thoughts on particular matchups or how you're feeling about this weekend. Anything you want to see? Well, um, I, I think you have to look at both of their opponents and look at the opponents that Texas has played. Uh, and I think that Texas has got a little bit more of a better opponent when you look at the uh, games that they played. I think ULM, you know, started out with Jackson State, which they beat pretty handily. UAB had some turnovers uh, and lost that particular game. I think that you come into this as, as really focusing on doing the little things right, getting, like I said before, getting Arch in a good rhythm, you know, finding him uh, comfortable plays that he likes because things are going to change. I think that he's a little bit more athletic than Queen Ewers is. We, you know, you saw that on the big run. You know, I think everybody really is is enamored because he's Arch Manning, but I, I think he's a really, really good player. And this is a time where you get him in that groove and you kind of oil him up and let him work. Defensively, I like what you mentioned. Let's get some of these guys some experience. I think, you know, not a lot of people are talking about Texas only giving up six points a game at, on average out of these games that they play. They've been playing really good team defense. I, Jade Barron is what I, who I've really been impressed with the most. His ability to fly around and make plays, he's all over the place. I think he's a, you know, he's working on all conference, all American type thing, working himself, his draft grades going up. Uh, Malik Muhammad's played well. I know he hadn't got a lot of targets at him, but, you know, that's saying something about his reputation as a, as a uh, you know, a lockdown corner. Um, I, I think interiorly, they, they've been playing well. Uh, I'd like to see more from Trey Moore, you know what I mean? Uh, super impressed with Colin Simmons. Uh, you know, I think he's he's doing what I thought he'd do. You know what I mean? I, and I think by the time the end of the year, we're talking about a guy that's really going to be uh, one of those freshman All-American type candidates coming out uh, for the University of Texas. So, uh, and then, you know, let's get some special teams work in. Work in. I, I think the kicking game is going to come back. We're going to need that. So, if, you know, from, from a coaching perspective, that's what I'd be looking at. Uh, as far as a score prediction, I would say, you know, it's probably going to be, you know, 56 to 10 or something like that. I don't think that ULM kind of, uh, you know, they don't scare me offensively. I think that Texas really, uh, you know, especially at home, they play very, very well. 
it's supposed to be pretty warm as well. So we're going to have to look at trying to get as many bodies on the field. Uh, hydrate, hydrate is supposed to be up in the upper 90s, very humid. So those are the type of external things that I think that they'll look at as a culture staff. Uh, and then this is this is a momentum builder going into, you know, getting ready to go into SEC play. Very true. Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. So I think it was. I think it was last year that maybe it was two years ago. Uh, what I'm uh, what I'm thinking about here that also I haven't mentioned yet on the show, it's supposed to be hot on yeah. Saturday. Right. It's supposed to be like 97 degrees at kickoff or something right. like that. It's well, got, I mean, game. I don't know if you live in Texas. I live up I in Dallas and it's yeah. been hot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I live in the DFW area, so I'm well yeah. familiar with that. Um, and, and that's that's what, you know, I've kind of been watching it as far as things like that. You know, you have to get all of that goes into account. Uh, and you have yeah. to look at that as a team, you know, and that's just where I think that depth comes in. You mentioned other guys getting involved. Uh, I like I like what Jared Gibson's been doing here the last couple of weeks as well. I think he's a guy that's really stepped up. Of course, uh, Trey Wiseman has, you know, been pretty consistent. Uh, but, you know, I, I think this is another game where you don't really have to play Jaden Blue. When he comes back, he's ready to go in the SEC. You really got some guys that have uh, got that experience under their belt now. That You know, they're not going to shy away from the big moment now. Yeah, very true. Um, you know, one thing that yeah, and one thing that you mentioned about uh, the edge rushers that I had meant to talk about at some point this week or do an article about, but um, and maybe I still will. I think it's interesting right now the Colin Simmons Trey Moore dynamic. Um, it's almost reversed uh, when I, I I do a lot of like situational stats and stuff like down to like what particular down are these guys playing on when what situations. Um, on what I call clear, like clear run down and I, I don't non-passing downs, third mm -hmm. and short, uh, fourth, you know, fourth and go for it, fourth and short goal line situations, plays like that. Um, in the first half, if you look at the splits between Colin Simmons and Trey Moore, Trey Moore is getting, uh, 75% more snaps on clear rundowns on defense in the first half than Simmons. In true pass sets on true passing downs in the first half, uh, it's about an equal split between them two. In the second half, it's a gargantuan gap. It's about 80% Colin Simmons. They're getting Colin in a lot of advantageous pass rush situations and really trying to get him those reps. I think it's interesting. Whereas mm -hmm. Trey Moore, it's been a little bit tougher for him because they're you know, not just telling them, pin your ears back, go to the quarterback. They're telling him, you know, you got to set the edge, defend the run, you know, go find the ball carrier kind of more like hybrid linebacker duties that we expected yeah. he might play this year. So I think, yeah, I think it's interesting you bring that up. Um, okay. Uh, there are two things I wanted to ask you that I got in Tarek's predictions on just for this game that I just thought were interesting. You mentioned Jared Gibson. Um, this is kind of a two-parter. I am of the mindset that Jaden Blue probably doesn't play this weekend. If he does, not very much because the ankle sprain, you know, he held out last weekend for the UTSA game. I don't think that Jaden Blue or Trey Wisner touches double digit carries this weekend. Do you? No, no. Okay. And that's why I brought up Jared Gibson. I think he's going right. to get more of a load. Uh, you know, he's a bigger back, you know what right. I mean, that can kind of pound it. Uh, and, you know, everything coming out of Austin is they've been ranting and raving about the, the, the power running ability of this guy when he gets in the open field. Uh, I think, you know, two years from now, he's going to be that he's guy. He's a bowling ball. He's, he's, <laughs> a, he's a man. He's a man. Yeah. Of I love his running style. Uh, you know, I know, it, you know, he had the little fumble that kind of, you know, put him back in the rotation a little bit when when Blue was playing. But I, and that's why I brought him up. I think this is a game where he gets he goes over 100 yards, you know, and maybe a couple of touchdowns. Uh, you know, you, you want to save your horses for when you need them. There's no need to to, uh, you know, expend blue when he's got a high, high ankle sprains tend to nag. They tend to lean, yeah. you know, depending on the degree and uh, the grade of the sprain. So, you know, I totally agree sure. with that. And that's why I brought Gibson up. I thought, you know, the last couple of games, especially even in even in, uh, in Michigan, in the big house, he had some pretty good runs in short yeah. draw situations. And I, I think it's, the more you get a guy like that experience, the more he gets comfortable and you find out what you got later on down the, down the line. And then, you know, bringing up Colin Simmons, you want to get this guy ready to go. He's He is going to be that guy. You know, I had yeah. a chance to meet Colin when he was a sophomore. 
and I've seen plenty of him up close and personal, both state championship runs. This is what I expected to see from him. You know, that's the reason he got there early. You know, he got into the program. He got on the weights. He's got, I heard he's gained about 20 pounds. You know, he, he, when I met him as a sophomore, he looked like a grown man. So I can only imagine the pictures that I've seen and what I've heard coming out of Austin that he's ready to go. I think he's such a competitor, too, that you got to look at, you know, Trey Moore and him tra trading snaps. That's really driving him to do what he needs to do. If you kind of look at this, is the same kind of role that Anthony Hill played last year coming off the edge as well. So similar styles, similar situations for a similar athlete, uh, you know, when it comes to making those big plays on third down. Agreed. Yeah, my my apologies. I yeah, you mentioned earlier already that you thought the Gibson would go over 100 yards. You actually answered the question for me. I'd asked Tarek that earlier. Um, yeah, and it's cool that you mentioned the whole like Anthony Hill, Colin Simmons comparison because what they were both able to. Well, you know what Colin Simmons is doing now, but yeah, what Hill was doing as a true freshman is that hybridized edge rusher, outside right. backer. Yeah, he was second on the team in in sacks last year. Colin right now tied for the if he's not outright tied for the team league because he's got i believe two Absolutely. um uh, what 11 quarterback pressures he's been awesome um so my second question here and i know we talked about i know you mentioned trey owens already so i think i already know the answer to this question too but i'd ask Tarek, do you think that we see any of arch manning in the second half well, it depends on the, how the game's going, you know. Yeah. Football is, is very trendy, you know. Uh, you know, I was reading something today where the uh, ULM coach mentioned that some of the guys played against Arch in high school and they beat him. Uh, you know, that's 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 bulletin board material. And those are the type of yep. things that you see uh, that could stick, make it a little steamy. Arch is a competitor. You know, he's going to want to get as much run as he can. But if they're up 35-0 at halftime, you don't risk it. But if it's a, you know, 17 nothing game – or, you know, less than the the, the amount that Arch, Arch and, uh, you know, Sarkin and offense want to see, you may come two or three drives in the second half. I think this is where you you get Trey Owens a little wet uh, behind the beak on this thing because I, I think he's, you know, I had a chance to see Trey Owens when he was in high school. He's a, he's a competitor. And he's a guy that really wants it. Um, and and he, he feels that he's a starter, you know what I'm saying? And I like the, everything that he's been doing, coming out of spring, coming out of camp. He was early enrollee as well. So he's tr interested in the program and what they're doing. So, you know, what's, what's the luxury of a program having three top-notch quarterbacks like that? You just don't see that on a regular basis, especially with the day of the transfer portal and guys want to go and like, start immediately. Sometimes that's just not the best, uh, you know, best avenue for you. You got to look at what the patience that Arch has shown since he's been there. You know, everybody wants to, you know, hey, when is Arch going to play? When he's ready, he's going to do it. And you see the, the fruits of the labor is when he came out and played well, not, you know, cold off the bench. You know, he rips off a 70 yard. His first pass was a touchdown. He's ready for prime time. And Sark knows he's ready for prime time. The coaching staff knows he's ready for prime time. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, taking the fan hat and putting it on, you just want to see those things because you're a fan of them. But when you look at the, the uh, structure of it and when you really examine the things that they're doing within the program. Everything's on the right trajectory when it comes to Texas. It's the reason they're number one right now. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, I don't really have much else for the game. I mean, uh, I I do think that, you know, next weekend or next week, we're going to be doing our SEC preview and talking the Mississippi State game. And then obviously we've got the bye week after that. But, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things to look through for the SEC right now. We kind of talked about some of those. Of, but, you know, Texas, they avoid most. I Well, they avoid all, I think, of the top dogs in the SEC besides Georgia. And so, right. you know, for teams like, uh, like a Tennessee, Mizzou, and Texas in particular, I think have really advantageous schedules coming up. Right. So, I, you know, I think Texas right now, yeah, you win that Georgia game and you're – yeah, just don't slip up any against right. any of these well, games I, I in October, think, November. I think you have to look at, uh, you know, this is this this is the SEC. You can't yeah. overlook anybody. I thought Kentucky played well against Georgia. They had them on the ropes. You know, one or two plays here, Georgia's got a loss there. Uh, they just couldn't generate anything offensively. And I think that Kentucky's better than than what people think of. That was a they had them at home. They had them dead at the at rights, and they just couldn't finish it. So, you know, uh, it's a thing where Texas just has to stay focused on the game plan, not listen to the outside noise. I know those things sound cliche, circle the wagons, 
you know, don't don't read your own clippings. But those are the type of things. If I'm on that coaching staff, that's what I'm preaching to these guys. Don't 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 think your stuff don't stink. You know, this is the type of thing that you have to do in order to win championships. It's a long season, and we see how it's happened. You know, with injuries and things that happen within the program from game to game. You know, it could be the next man up, and you have to be able to count on these guys. These are the games where you get these guys ready for the SEC play, the ULMs. Uh, you know, getting ready for Mississippi State. You got a bye week. So you really got three weeks to get ready for Oklahoma, you know, if you look at it yeah. down the line, and, you know, from a program standpoint. Because, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, rivalry games, you can throw uh, records out of the window, especially when it comes to Oklahoma, you know. So yeah. it, it's a thing where, you know, you just have to keep everything uh, in-house. You know, I think this, you know, every time you hear one of these guys talking, you know, I'm a religious podcast watcher. I watch 30 Longhorn. I've seen all of the interviews from those guys, from John T. Cook, uh, you know, to Manny Muhammad and all those guys. The bond that they seem to have within the program is at an all-time high. You don't see these guys, you know, bashing each other. You don't see them not, you know, talking one another up. Trey Owens has been interviewed. All of those guys, Baron Sorrell, the... Overall thing that you get about this program and this team right now is they're really focused on the end goal, and that's a national championship. Yeah. SEC, their national championship. Yeah, you hit that turning point, really. I, I mean, not a super fun one to bring up, but I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of Texas fans remember the Moro Ajomo press conference yeah. where he really aired out a lot of dirty laundry from a few Absolutely. years ago. and. Um, but, you know, you had your Rojos, your Jay Wits, you know, these leaders within the program that really – turn the culture around or started to and you're right you're starting to see that you you know starting to see where the culture is where you've wanted it to be for the past decade it is there now um and you know to your point about ou and i and you know texas having what mississippi state ulm and a bye week Tark brought up a good point earlier you know this mississippi state game next weekend is a good preparation for ou's offense because you're going to get some similar spread concepts you face jeff levy you're facing a quarterback that while yes is not i think like a true running quarterback i think blake shape and, and jackson arnold he has some athleticism to him yeah both yeah. both are going to run the ball i mean ou has to run it this year with jackson arnold as i was saying earlier because if they don't their offense is just stagnant all, otherwise, yeah. all they have is that slot pass to Deion Burks, and that's it. Yeah. Maybe some speed yeah. stuff with Brennan Thompson. But, you know, if anyone knows how to deal with Brennan Thompson and his speed, it's it's going to be Texas score he transferred out of. Right. Oh, but, you know, for OU, their next two games are Tennessee at home and then Auburn on the road and then Texas. They don't have any off weeks. Like, they can't afford yeah. to just sit back and prepare for Texas. If they do, they're going to lose the next two games. Right. Well, I, so. I think when to me when OU's been dominant is when they had a dominant running game. Um, yeah, you know you got to go back to Adrian Peterson, uh, Quentin Griffin, and those guys, uh, and they haven't got that guy yet. I think Taylor Tatum shows some flashes, but they got to get him. They got to get him the ball more. I think he can do it, but he's a freshman, and I think they're kind of bringing him along slowly. When they've been dominant, they've had a, a, a you know a keen eye on that running game. It's when you've seen all these offensive linemen go to the first round. Uh, they also had a dominant receiver. You go back to Marvin Mims. You know, they just haven't got that guy. Anderson's been hurt. I don't know if he's playing yet. Uh, I, I've, They've know, been really banged up. People. They've been banged up. So they haven't got a full throttle of what they can do. That's why I said their defense is ahead. Billy Bowman has been playing phenomenal uh, on the oh, back yeah. end. You know, so I, I think oh, right now OU's defense is ahead of the game. Uh, you know, you can go to that U of H game. They struggle 16 to 12. Yeah. And U of H played a really good game defensively. They just stifled them uh, offensively, and they just weren't able to get to p- make the plays, but they ended up getting a couple of balls bounced here and there. That was a game Houston could have won. I, I happen to see that game. So uh, it's just a thing where I think, you know, this is going to be a test for them. They get by Tennessee, and they go to Auburn, and they win, and I think we're saying something about OU making it through those two games. Yeah, and if not for OU's defense coming up big and really just having to rely on Jackson they Arnold's dual losses. threat. Yeah, they yeah, because they were within one score or two lane last weekend in the fourth Absolutely. quarter. Right. So, yeah, 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 100%. Um, I don't really have anything else to add unless you got anything else you wanted to say before we jump off here. Man, hook them. I'll be watching, man. You know, keep following us on at Hook'em Headlines, man. And, uh, you know, we, we're we going to keep doing what we do. Yeah, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, like I said, we'll be back next week. Um, Mark, we're going to have a guest on next week. So, getting kind of cycled through the show, but I don't know if you've seen anything with Nash before. 
um, uh, with Nash Talks Texas. He's joined the show a couple of times in the last Absolutely. year, and so um, okay. we'll try to get him on for next week. But uh, anyway, for uh, Andrew Miller, Mark Henry, and Tarp the core from before, um, that's pretty much it. Welcome. Welcome.